So who, everybody wants security. Everyone, everyone wants, wants prosperity. And what the hell is partnership? What's partnership? Well, they don't explain that. Well, the partnership is a partnership between, between uh, a big, big corporate and, and big government. That's the partnership, and, and, and the people are nowhere in sight. Did you all see the Godfather films? Do you remember the scene in the, it might have been the second one, where the mafia bosses are, are sitting around uh, Havana, Cuba on a patio, and there's a birthday cake, and they're slicing up the cake, and they're handing out slices. Well, the cake is the big pie of all of the benefits, and the slices are all going to them, and nothing is going to the ordinary people, which are the great majority of us, all of us sitting here today. Well, this is what they want incrementally, and they're getting more and more as they strip away our rights, they destroy our social services, and they need to do this to be able to give the big corporate interests what they want, uh, basically, the big corporate interests are represented uh, in, the, in, in these groups. They meet secretly. They have secret roundtable discussions. Uh, uh, one series was, was a series of seven secret meetings where they're getting together. Uh, there are some meetings that are more public. The most recent one took place in April in New Orleans, of all places. Uh, there was great protest on the streets against it. This is the last public meeting that I'm aware of. But the most important, like the tip of the iceberg, uh, what, what, you, what you learn about publicly, you can be sure that the worst things going on are going on privately that we don't know anything about, so we can't write about them. But again, it comes down to literally a coup d'etat against democracy. Uh, this, this country has never been a perfect democracy to think it has been. E even the framers, who were probably the best of the best we ever had, but uh, they designed this, 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 this a, a, at least a, a system of laws that to some degree protected us. Although the glorious Bill of Rights, which is re really the most glorious things that we have, even they weren't designed for us. They were designed for the elitist segment of society because they wanted the protections for themselves. So we were very flawed from the very beginning. But over the years, we've gone down. We, we, we've had our higher points. We've had our lower points. Uh, in more recent times, I, I think maybe at the beginning of the Trilateral Commission, Connie mentioned it, that uh, came about around 1973. Uh, Jimmy Carter was a charter member. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, I think, w was a very formative member of that group. The Rockefellers were the ones who wanted it. The problem that they saw was a crisis of democracy in the country, 1973. So call it uh, 35 years ago. A crisis of democracy, too much of it, too much of it. And their design was to strip it away, piece by piece by piece. Well, trade is one thing, NAFTA, WTO, World Trade Organization. There was a trade agreement between the US and Canada before NAFTA. And uh, when Brian Mulroney, the Prime Minister of Canada back in the 80s, the Ronald Reagan counterpart, when he became Prime Minister, he took a trip down to the New York Economics Club, I think shortly into his tenure. And his, his line was so dramatic that uh, I guess I can quote him verbatim. He said, Canada is open for business. Well, what did he mean by that? Come on up and buy our stuff. Come on up and take our resources. Come on up and, uh, you know, we're kind of an adjunct to you guys. And I, I'm on the same page with you. And uh, I'm up here what Ronald Reagan is down there. Canada is open for business. Well, it's been more open ever since. Continuing from Reagan to Bush Sr. to Bill Clinton, where they came up with the Democrat, Democratic Leadership Council. Again, supremely pro-corporate, supremely pro-corporate. Think also that these corporations are getting bigger and more powerful all the time. Give me control of the money supply, and I don't give a damn what your government does. Because the money supply is the lifeblood of running a country. You control the money, you control everything. You want to know what the most powerful industry is in the country? I've actually got two. The financial industry overall, it's hard just to say the bankers, 
the financial industry overall, because they control the money, they control the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve is a private for profit banking cartel. It's owned by the member banks in Wall Street, 12 districts. The big banks sit on the boards of each of the districts, and they run everything. They pick the governors, they pick the Fed chairman, the president may make the announcement. He doesn't have a damn thing to say about it. They pick their own people. And if the guy doesn't do the job, could be a woman. There have been w women governors and, and very capable ones. Uh, there'll be a woman governor, a uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve at some point. Uh, they are servants of the financial community. But the financial community is so intertwined now between the investment banks and the commercial banks and the insurance companies and all the other stuff that they do, the mortgage lenders, and they have the rating agencies all controlled. And, and the whole system is, is rigged to benefit them. The, the other dominant industry for me, twin, the twin dominant industries, is a big media. Big media. Because the media could bring down the whole system if they report it honestly. Big media is a propaganda service. The CBC in Canada is a propaganda service. The BBC in the UK is a propaganda service. Well, thank you very much. I am uh, very honored to be here. I am most pleased to have had one of the articles that I've written uh, recognized. And um, truly, I, uh, I, I'm honored by it. And I thank you, thank you for that. It's nice to, nice to know that something you write is, uh, is being read in a fairly wide circle. And it's nice to believe that some of your own um, serious interests are the same interests that other people feel and express. And so it's nice to connect with the community of like minds and like souls. Um, the article in question that is an issue which I wrote called uh, The SPP is a Hostile Takeover of the Apparatus of Democracy really a, a, I'm not going to read it to you. You can go to wherever you go in your system here to find it. You can go to the Canadian Action Party website, www.canadianactionparty.ca. That article is there. Uh, uh, an article I wrote in 2000, 2005 uh, called The Metamorphosis, Metamorphosis and Sabotage of uh, our country by our own government is on that site. And in that article, a very long article, three sections, I went through, documented a lot of the, the, the practices and the developments that had, had been going on since, actually since 2001, and made reference to, to practices that were happening before that. But in this particular article, I focused on, I started just by saying four things, four steps, and let me just review that quickly. I said the first formal step towards the creation of the North American Union was NAFTA. And uh, the second formal step was the integration and subjugation of Canada's military into the U.S. military command under NORAD, NORTHCOM, and the Binational Planning Agreement. I said the third formal step in the creation of the North American Union was the implementation of the respective liberty-stripping anti-terrorist legislations, the Patriot Act in the USA and the Anti-Terrorist Act in Canada. The fourth step is the Security and Prosperity Partnership Agreement. That's what I call is the hostile takeover of the executive branch of government, a coup d'etat over the government operations of Canada, USA, and Mexico. Now, my understanding is that um, the, this project censored uh, is a soci sociology program, but that you're focusing on, on, on media, on the role of media um, as one of the aspects. That's what you do. You look at articles that have been written and that had some significance as determined by your, your readers, and uh, you're trying to profile them. And I want to congratulate you on that project, first of all, before I say anything else. I want to say to you, that it's my deepest belief at one level, an intellectual recognition at another level, 
the most important thing for all of us in the world, if we believe in freedom and democracy, is to understand the importance of thinking. Thinking, studying, analyzing, dissecting, making your own determinations, making your own judgments based on reading and analysis and thinking. And I say, and I believe, that the most important factor that's gonna save humanity in this world that's gone crazy is the capacity of human beings to think and to analyze. And I say that the weapon that's used against all of us is fear. And fear is deliberately used to prevent us from thinking. So understand that, pay attention to that. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be afraid many times, but just analyze the fact of that fear. And remember that that's a weapon used against us. You'll feel the fear, that's human. But use your brain and your heart to go beyond that and do what you can do, and that's to know. Knowledge is our protection. And so what you're doing here in this Project Censored is a very, very, very important part of that communication to human beings to recognize that it's really important always to study and to think and to learn and to analyze and to know, to know, to know. And you can know by what you read and you can know by what's in your heart as you analyze. That's all part of your mental capacity. It goes together. So just know that. I believe that fundamentally and completely, and I'm thankful to you for the role and the work that you're doing here. And I think similar kinds of things in different kinds of ways are, are happening around the world, and that's where the hope is. Because we can get buried in the recognition of all the horrible direction of the world and the restructuring of the world um, into a one world order and to get very disturbed and very depressed and very discouraged and very frightened. But ultimately, I always know that working together as individuals, thinking our own thoughts, analyzing, doing our analyzing, not allowing ourselves to be dumbed down, not allowing ourselves to uh, be made fearful, continuing to realize our power to understand and to know is our security. And ultimately, it will be our prosperity, security and prosperity for the people. You see, the Security and Prosperity Partnership Agreement, great words, aren't they? Everybody wants to be secure, and everybody wants to be prosperous. You have to understand the Orwellian language. That's, again, why it's important what you're doing when you're talking about media, you're talking about learning, you're talking about reading, you're talking about thinking. Understand the Orwellian language that's at work. You say one thing over here, but it really means something else over here, right? We want to be secure. We want to be prosperous. Well, the Security and Prosperity Partnership Agreement that's in, that, that exists that is the uh, governmental facilitation of an agenda of a corporate elite has everything to do with making that corporate elite prosperous. In turn, it makes the people poor. It impoverishes us. It has everything to do with making that corporate elite secure. And in turn, it makes us imprisoned, insecure, because the apparatus of the police state, which has descended upon us since the 9-11 incident, which was the justification for creating the police state, the Patriot Act and Canada's anti-terrorist legislation, has everything to do with containing the resistance of the people, of the people who want to be free, who were born with an entitlement to be free, to be democratic, to live in their domain and make their decisions according to what's right for them in their community, where they live, how they want to live, under their choices, under their rule, under their representation. The regime change that's in process for North America has everything to do with removing democratic constitutional functioning. It has everything to do with turning us back to a serfdom reality. 
And so as you do your work, whether you're at the university or whether you're in your community or whether you're in your business or whether you're in your home, you always have to come back to paying attention to the kind of language that's out there and what is really being meant. In terms of the media, let me draw your attention to a statement that was made by David Rockefeller, who was a founder of the Trilateral Commission, in an, in an address to a meeting of the Trilateral Commission in June 1991. He said, We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now much more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. Do you understand what he's saying? What he's saying is what your country was founded on, your constitutional structure, your constitutional rock, what Canada's constitution gives to its citizens, what our country was founded on, is now passé. The concepts of, in, of, of, of national sovereignty, of the right for self-determination, it's... It, it's not relevant anymore. And what's relevant is to recognize that now the world has progressed to a stage where what's right for the world is that an elite military, financial, corporate control is going to be the rule. And there will no longer be a representation by the people, of the people, for the people. Those words were important when they were said, and they remain important, and they mean a lot. They mean everything to liberty. They mean everything to sovereignty. They mean everything to the capacity to make your own decisions. That's what it's all about. Who's going to make the decisions? And when the decision makers make a decision, in whose interest does that, is, that, is that decision made? And whose interest will it serve? That's the ultimate test for any politician. And that should be the test of any academic. That should be the test of any citizen when you're looking at anything to try to understand what's going on. What does that ultimately do for me? Who is it really serving? Then I want to remind you of a farewell address to the nation by President Dwight D. Eisenhower in January 1961, who gave a stern and necessary warning to the American people against the growing and dangerous power of the military-industrial complex. It was in reference to describing the intimate relationship between the military establishment, the political structure, and the defense industry. In his speech, Eisenhower said, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. 
the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. And he warned, we must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Security, liberty, prosperity. Think about who's using the words how, okay? I'm actually reading some of those notes from a very young person, a, a young fellow by the name of Andrew Marshall up in Canada who made a presentation to actually as a 9-11 um, weekend of speakers. And I'm referring to him, I want to tell you about him because he was very young. He was only about 19 or 20 and he did an absolutely masterful presentation. And I like it because it's so important that the young people are studying and are thinking and are learning what's going on and understand, reading history, understanding history, assessing and coming to conclusions. They're our hope. It is the duty of those of us who have lived a while, have been around for some time, to see to it that we pay attention to what's going on and analyze and function as well, but that we, we pave the way for the young ones to come along and see to it that the world is going to be there for the children who come beyond, behind, my grandchildren, the grandchildren of the young people that are here today. Because that entitlement is an inheritance, a birthright, that belongs to all of us. It does not belong to an elite, financial, corporate, military few who say the world of today belongs to them. It's their playing field. The people of Mexico should have the mobility to be the cheap labor across North America. The resources of Canada should not, or should be the resources of that financial, corporate, military elite to use what they want. And doesn't matter whether the Canadians are going to run out of gas to feed their feed uh, to to fuel their homes. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if the environmental rules are removed so that there can be no protection of those um, those resources that will prevent the 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 the, the loss of uh, of uh, of the lumber industry, we say, the people of the United States, of Canada, and of Mexico say, and we have a right to say, and we must continue to say, hold on. This is our place. This is our home. This is our right. We will say what we're going to do with the people of Canada, United States, and Mexico, and with the resources of Canada and the United States of Mexico. It's not going to be an elite few who are unelected, unrepresentative, unaccountable, who are in control right now, who have created a structure, and they're implementing that structure bureaucratically, administratively, by the use of the executive arm of government the bureaucrats who were there, who used to serve the public good, who used to take a, an oath when they came to work in Canada, I presume they did in the States, where they promised to serve the interest of the people of the country. They no longer do that. They now move back and forth between government and industry. And their job is to serve the interests only of the corporate elite. Nothing wrong with corporations functioning and businesses fun We need that. It's just that their interests are usually not necessarily the interests of the masses of the people, and so there have to be rules and regulations that, that control just exactly where they're going to go and how they're going to go and when they get beyond the interests of the human being. Right now, because of the agenda that's in, prospe in, in process, started 
a long time ago, actually, never, it has never gone away. The elite have always been around, whether it's the, the wealthy families going back to, uh, going back to uh, kings and queens uh, throughout uh, the world, uh, through the big fam wealthy families, financial elite throughout the world, through to the, the, the major corporations who were around during the Second World War, who, who worked on both sides. Um, IBM making the equipment, you know, for the concentration camps. You've, there's all sorts of literature, and I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of time to deal with all the, the material that exists that documents, names the companies, names the representatives in the companies, names the groups, the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, the Council in Canada, the Council of Foreign Relations in the United States, and there's a comparable body in Mexico, who are the people that have, that have managed to drive an agenda, which is their agenda, okay, they've got their agenda, uh, they say we want, the, we want the power, we want to have everything our way, we want, it, we want to have all the goodies, we don't want the people to interfere, okay, that's their agenda. There was a period in time when governments held them down, especially after the wars, when the people said, look, we died, we suffered, we want something now, we want homes, we want jobs, we want education, we want health protection. And for periods of time after those wars, governments listened to the people. Time has gone by and they've stopped listening to the people and they're listening to the power of the financial military corporate elite. And so we've got this agenda that's always been around. And in 2005, the three leaders of Canada, the United States and Mexico met in Texas to sign just an informal kind of an arrangement that's called the Security and Prosperity Partnership Agreement. It's not a formal international agreement deliberately, deliberately, because if it were that, it would have, it, it, it would have certain international legal rules that would require a certain kind of responsibility. Bad enough, the NAFTA regime that exists, which is an international agreement, that, that has its own tribunals apart and separate from our domestic laws. That's bad enough as it is, but at least it is a legal structure and at least you can do some things in relation to it. Now they will have the kind of mechanisms of the NAFTA administrative structure that has, we don't elect anybody to it, we can't remove them, they don't represent us, the people, they only represent that corporate structure. But you see, they won't have the legal ramification at all because they, the, the they call it the shadow government, call it the military financial corporate elite, know that they can get their way easier and more likely by incrementalization rather than an overt, outright takeover, a formalization structurally of a new entity in North America with a new name, and wherein the people were given a choice. Do you want to become a new country called whatever? or not, and you would vote like they did in the European Union. And I could live with that if people in Canada and people in the United States and people in Mexico said, yes, we don't want the kind of structure that we had before. We want to all come together and we want to have representation amongst all of us and create a new kind of government. But it's not going to be that, you see. What they're doing, and in a minute I'll take you to some of the documentation. God, you talk. Um, uh, what, what they're doing is incrementally, administratively restructuring us, bureaucratically, between the corporations' management and the government management. They meet. There are 100 working groups, at least 100 working groups, have been meeting after the formalization of the agreement in 2005, and the leaders meet every year, and they talk about where do we get, where, how have we progressed to date. And one of the things they've done in uh, 2006, I think it was, one of the points that they focused on was creating a North American Competitiveness Council. And what that was is 10 to 15 representatives from industry who now sit on the right-hand side of the President of the United States, the President of Mexico, and the, the Prime Minister of Canada, and basically give them their marching orders. They've institutionalized, they've legitimated the corporate rule. They've just done it. And the tragedy for us is that the people in Congress and the people in our parliament, the representatives that we've elected, haven't 
brought down the governments. We could have done it in Canada because we have a minority government, because that's totally unconstitutional. These are people are unelected, unaccountable, unrepresentative, but they're sitting there with more power than our elected people. That's part of this, the, the formalized restructuring of, of this, this area that we're in. I think I should, I should just jump, like, jump quickly, I think, to tell you some of the documentation that exists. It's not what, you see, we, we're in an election, a snap election right now in Canada, and the people who are in there, um, whether it's a prime minister or the cabinet ministers, or whether it's the people who are elected as members of parliament, most of them will say, it's not true that there's a process going on that's integrating North America. That's just a conspiracy theory. It's not really happening. Um, but there are tons of documents done, written by the people who were doing it. A discussion paper of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, April 2004, <laughs> talks about building a 21st century, Canada-United States partnership in North America. There's a trilateral cooperation charter, 2004. There's a North American Future 2025 project. Um, this is from the Center for Strategic International Studies. They talk about all, the, all, all of what their plans are. There's uh, New Frontiers, Building a 21st Century Canada-United States Partnership in North America, April 2004. And when you look at the actual language, they, they, they acknowledge and they talk about their process of what they want. These are the, these are the, the, the movers and the shakers in the international uh, industrial, military, financial structure. We're saying this is the paradigm that we want. And then they put it to the elected people and say, we want you to, d to deliver this. And we've had elected people say, after the, this group, this uh, competitiveness council was created, that they meet with them. And they actually, the elected people actually say, we welcome what they tell us to do. And then we just go out and we implement it. And you have to know that in 2005, the three leaders came away. And they, had, they, then, they then appointed three people from each of their respective governments to be the driving force to funnel the restructuring in our respective countries into the integration so that you've got people in our government, people we have elected, people that are supposed to represent us, people that are supposed to be accountable to us, having the audacity to be committing treason. Because what they are doing is destructuring three countries that have constitutions that say, we're independent, we're free, we're constitutionally intact, we have the right to make our own decisions, we have the right to be different. That's in our constitution, those are supposed to be our protections in law. And these people are actually working in mechanisms that destructure us and, and create a regime change. They're actually doing this and they have no right to do that, but they're doing it and they're getting away with it because nobody challenges them. We've got an election going on in Canada, about to go on right now. The mainstream parties won't talk about this at all. It's just not on their agenda. They just won't deal with it. Let me just tell you quickly before I quit and let you ask me some questions. Um, I could give you the names of the people that are on this, the companies that are involved. Uh, I just wanted to take you uh, to some of the language, actually, that had been made. Oh, man. Too much paper. Some of the language that's made by some of the people who represent us, a uh, person who was uh, our uh, representative, is a former deputy prime minister of Canada, um, used language that says nationalism is passé, sovereignty is passé. These are people that were elected and held significant positions in government who are saying it's now to get on with this other agenda. And the corporate elite know that they have to move incrementally. You see, there are two ways to conquer people. You can conquer them with war or you can conquer them with money, with the economy. And what elected people will say and what the think tanks of the military, financial, corporate, industrial complex will say is, this is just trade. It's free trade. The biggest misnomer that ever existed. It's nothing to do with free, except that it's, 
except that it's free for the corporations because you see, it removes, their, their point is to let the corporate structure function free from any interference on their profits, free from the regulations that protect people, whether it's a Merck pharmaceutical corporation that wants to administer Gardasil to girls, that's not tested and true, and that now that they've been that it has been out, and these, this Merck is going to is making a fortune out of this, and, and, and the efforts to make it compulsory. There have been some struggles, uh, some some good wins in the United States against that. Um, is Merck is one of the is one of the driving forces in the Competitiveness Council. We have to understand. You see, you, there were three three areas, the three important areas to realize that are going on right now. The United States is responsible for the deregulation, and, and deregulation is not a good thing. At one level, a lot of people say, I don't want rules by government. I want to be free. Well, think about it for a minute. We all want to be free, but, but there are levels of what the freedom is. Whose freedom? The regulations that can be in place to protect us from things that are going to hurt us need to be there. The corporations say, we don't want any regulations that interfere with our profits, and if people die, because they're taking pharmaceutical drugs that are untested, we don't care. You know that your Congress passed, uh, or was it just Bush that unilaterally declared um, uh, a, a ruling, a law that, that frees the pharmaceutical corporations from any harm that their products give to the citizens? Uh, in the deregulation process, I mean, that's, that, you know, I'm a lawyer by, by training of one of the things I've done in my life. And one of the, one of the big torts, one of the big aspects of functioning is, uh, is being able to sue somebody that's done you harm. And an entitlement, that that's, a, that that's a democratic entitlement. If somebody hurts you, you have a right to be protected either criminally or civilly uh, by um, uh, financial remuneration for the harm that they've caused you, some kind of a, of a, of a return for that. That's been gone. Yes. Time. OK. Uh, I forget what my point was going to be, where I was going on that. Doesn't matter. Um, I think I should stop now in terms of the, uh, uh, the time frame and uh, realize and answer your questions. Um, just see if there's anything else I wanted to say. I can help you with the identification of some of the people. I can tell you that our, our people, representatives from Canada and from the United States, met in September of 2006 as they lie to us over and over, the people we've elected, and say this isn't happening. And then they have a private meeting in Banff in 2006, and you've got representatives from defense, representatives from government of all the levels, in the, the provincially, state, uh, federally. Uh, between our countries, uh, militarily, who are sitting down and talking about the progress that they're making as they're meeting with representatives from industry. Um, let me just read you some of the names of the people who were there in the implementation of the North American Union agenda, and their agenda even talked about the North American Union agenda. Well, they tell us politically it's not happening, it's just in your mind you're making it all up. There was George Schultz, who was the chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase's International Advisory Board, Pedro Aspi, an elitist from Mexico, Peter Lougheed, former Alberta Premier, Royal Bank of Canada reps, Carlisle Group reps, defense contractors from Carlisle Group, Colonel Peter Atkinson, advisor to the Chief Defense Staff, Thomas DeKino, chairman of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, Stockwell Day, our Minister of Public Safety, Ward Elcott, various people from various levels of government, um, Nortel, CIBC, Rick Hellyer, the Chief of Defence Staff in Canada. Chevron. Um, oh, God, this goes on and on. I think I'll just end by saying this. You have to, we all know about the concentration of media in the United States and in Canada. In Canada, we've got CanWest Global Communications. We've got Quebec Or. Uh, they're the conglomerates that, that are responsible for almost all the media that we have here. You've got about four groups that control all the media here. Um, let me end with the ending that this young student made, where he talked about the fact that the media silence has proven that the media in Canada has lost all relevance and trust and is merely a voice box for the corporate elite to espouse distracting issues for the public while stifling and silencing dissenting opinions, not to mention deceiving Canadians about massive agendas that the media conglomerates are intricately involved in. 
And then he said this, and I think it's important. Yet there is still hope, demonstrated by the fact that he was able to stand forward and talk on these issues. We can still talk, even though the law, the apparatus to, to prevent us from talking is all there, ready to descend. It's there. But they don't drop it on us so long as people like you will continue to do what you're doing. I hope that you will now choose to inform yourself. I ask you not to simply believe everything that he said he said. I ask you not to believe everything that our governments and media say, but rather investigate and research these issues for yourselves to come to your own conclusions. Look to the issues that are being discussed. Remember, every great movement that changed the world for the better started out with a small group of people. We have the potential to make a difference but we must not sit back and wait for someone else to solve the problems because no one else will. It is up to each and every one of us to stand up and protect our freedom and our democracy. Thomas Jefferson once said, the cost of eternal freedom is eternal vigilance. So be vigilant, stand up to those who need to be taken down. Let us heed the warning of Eisenhower when he stated, we should take nothing for granted. Mahatma Gandhi, the man who led India to independence from the tyrannical British Empire, once stated that, truth stands, truth stands, even if there is no public support. It is self-sustained. Absolutely. Absolutely, I have. Yes, I could say, I mean, the agenda is a world agenda, a corporate elite. You see, what now with the process that's going on is that the power blocks, there are power blocks in the world. There's a European Union. It's the same mentality and attitude there where there's a removal of the rights of the people slowly, being done more deceitfully here to us. Uh, we've, so the people, the, the movers and shakers of the power elite in North America want to assume for themselves um, the, the, the power to be able to compete against European Union and against an Asian bloc, and there's one other bloc. I think it's a, an African kind of bloc. And they're competing like little boys in a playing field in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sandbox. Um, and ultimately, the struggle is which group of corporate elite of the world are going to be the ones that finally have all the power in all the world. It's a, it's a power struggle that's been around from the creation of man, where uh, greed is something that exists in humans. Um, it's the force that exists and it can be unleashed and can, can get carried away. But I think the, on the other side of that coin, what a, lot of, what a lot of thinkers and writers are saying is that even those very, very greedy, corrupt, ugly groups and people that are ruling, ruling the world can be reached. They are all human. They are run by human beings. They do have consciences and they do have souls, even though sometimes you might think they don't. But they can be reached and they should be reached. Um, if you've read The Confessions of an Economic Hitman, um, Perkins, he's written another book com uh, subsequent to that. And everybody should read those books because he's a person who worked within the corporate elite system, whose job it was as an economic hitman to go out and to just, just exploit. And he couldn't live with himself. And he wrote the book to confess what he'd done, how he'd participated in that, in that regime. 
And he talked about the fact that people, these are, they are human beings and they can be reached, and there are many of them functioning out there. You see, if you manage to get into that spectrum, you're going to be very wealthy and you're going to do very well, but the rest of us who don't want to be part of that or can't be part of that for various reasons are going to be impoverished more and more. So it is a, it is a ball game. You ask about the concentration camps. Well, there's a lot of literature about the existence of them in the United States uh, and in Canada. Um, I, there's, I think there's some art, some references to it in our website. If you go to our website, there's sort of sections where you can look at everything. And uh, no one wants to believe that those exist, but neither did they want to believe that in Germany in Hitler's time. And I think it's important, don't take somebody else's word for it. Read about it, analyze it, study it. There are people who say they've seen them, they've been there, phone them, talk to them. Um, it's, it's worrisome to say the least. And well, who are they for? They're for you and me. They're for the, who are the first purple, the first people that were imprisoned in, in Hitler's Germany? It wasn't the Jews, you know. It was the academics. It was the dissenters. It was the people who dared to challenge, to say no. It was some of the religious people who said, this is wrong. They were the Jehovah's Witnesses, I think. It was the communists who were saying this is wrong. But most importantly, it was the dissenters, wherever they came from, and the academics were the first to be hit. The thinkers. Why do you think they went after the thinkers? The talkers. You don't want those people out there infecting the minds of the ordinary people. So it's, there's some information out here that's not very encouraging, but I say in looking at all that, look at it, read it, study it, analyze it, find out about it, but don't succumb to the fear that it makes you have. That's really, really important. Could you uh, tell us, well, I have two questions. Is there a man, a man in Canada like Robert Pastor, who is known as the father of the North American Union, like Robert Pastor is? And my other question, how far along are we to developing this yeah, okay. Are you saying, is there a man in Canada like a Robert Pastor? Well, we have a Thomas Dequino, who's the uh, chief spokesman of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, uh, which is the corporate elite of Canada. And, um, y you know, those, yes, there are people like that everywhere. Um, are, should we worry? Do we have anybody with as much power? Um, yes, we do too. The, the majority of the power is here in the States. The States is still... You're still, this country is still a very influential, powerful place. Most of the players are here. You're 300,000 people, 300 million people. We're 30. Um, you've got a lot of the leading powerful forces that are here. Canada used to be a place that prided itself on being very close to a very nice neighbor. And thank you very much. We like you as a neighbor, but we want to be different. And uh, we want to differ on some things. We like social programs. We happen to think that programs that help house all the people, that help deliver Medicare to all the people, that help provide education for everybody, that help deliver energy to everybody so that everybody's home can be lit and heated, that those should be done cooperatively and that that's a good thing. Um, I think there's not that that kind of a general recognition in the States in the same kind of a way. We have lots of people in Canada who don't want that either. Um, so there's like uh, a, a different philosophy about how to deliver the needs to, to satisfy the needs of the people. Um, but we no longer have leaders in Canada that are prepared to stand up and say, we like you, you guys, but you know, we want to be different. And that's a tragedy for Canadians and it's a tragedy for Americans. Um, because we've had a checking and a balancing and a testing and a, and a capacity to, to, you know, trade things off against each other and be a better place, a better North America, in my view. Um, our leadership right now, our military has totally, totally succumbed and been taken over by the, the military apparatus. Why are we Canadians in Afghanistan? You might ask, why are you there? Um, the whole 9-11 incident is a serious, a serious something. 
We have no leaders in Canada that will say, we're the only, we're the only party, there might be one or two other smaller parties, um, that say, and we might be the only party that say, the 9-11 situation, what happened here, has so many, the explanation, the official story has so many terrible, terrible holes in it. So many questions have been asked, so many significant questions have been asked, and explanations and challenges have been raised that need to be addressed. And it's, Canada should be calling for a question on that. And our leaders say to us when we ask that, it's not our issue, it's just something that happened in the States. There were lots of Canadians died there. People from other countries died there. They weren't only people from the States that died there. But that incident has been the justification for the imposition of a police state on Canadians and on people from the States and on people from other places of the world. It's interesting, don't you think, that after that event, within only weeks, the most complicated, sophisticated law, pages and pages and pages and pages long, suddenly was available in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, and in England, almost identical. You can't create law that fast. What's that all about? What's that all about? You, and did I answer both your questions? The Amero. Oh, the Amero. Uh, the Amero is, uh, is a coin, the name given to a coin that will be the common currency for North America, comparable to the Euro. Um, again, whenever you raise that, people talk about that as being conspiracy theory, and yet there's articles like Gavin uh, Hal Turno who talks about the Amero being real, and he's actually seen coins that apparently exist in Denver. Um, you just pay attention to what's been going on with the money, you know, the trouble with the U U.S., the value of the U.S. dollar, and then the Canadian dollar suddenly is almost equal to it, and then what will happen with the Mexican situation, we're not sure. The leaders talk about it being important to have Canada and the United States being the driving force of the harmonization, and Mexico will catch up later. Um, all the financial difficulties that, we, that are going on, they'll suddenly say, well, you know, it would be so much simpler if we, our, our money's almost worth the same, we might as well have the same coin. It's very important to understand that whoever controls your money controls everything. And it doesn't matter, doesn't matter who you've elected. If they don't have the power and the authority to issue and create your money, the people have no power. Well, there's so many quotes I could give you on, on, on money. Any other questions? One more brief question. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I've spent 45 years in the public school system, in the social studies area. If I say what you're saying, you say it's much, much, much more eloquently. Thank you for that. Well, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. The media, he dropped the section on media, military industrial, but he dropped the media section, the troika, if you will, but he dropped that for, uh, for the persuasion of some of his aides, feeling that that would stir the pot even further. I, I, I don't know the answer to the question on that, yeah. Okay. As, to the, as to the leadership in both Canada and, uh, and the United States, I, I appreciate your hopeful message. It seems to me that, that with our own election now, and Dr. Phillips had a great editorial on this in the Russian River Times earlier this year on this, there's really no choice, whether it's Harper or the opposition in Canada or Obama and, uh, and uh, McCain. We don't have I, any know, I know that. I agree. I, that's tr I, you just want me to comment on that, I presume. Can I comment on that? Um, th that's a significant political issue, and so... We do understand that, that it's true. The people who are selected to be your president and the people who are selected to be our prime minister, and believe me, they're selected. 
They're chosen in advance. There's a group called the Bilderbergers. Go, just Google Bilderberger. Been around for a long, Bilderberg was just a place in Europe and the, the elites of the world get together and they talk about who are going to be the leaders in the various places of the world according to the regime that the corporate financial elite wants. And our prime ministers have, and a lot of your people, they attend these meetings and they are, and academics change them. Academics are not so pure, you know. You got a lot of academics whose job it is to sell the corporate side. Academics should be the free thinkers. They should be the people that challenge. That's the ideal of what an academic is. Academic freedom is important. It's an, a democratic, a significant democratic something that still kind of exists, not as well as it used to when I was growing up, but it's, there's still good people. You got them here in this community, putting this kind of a program on. So you say, what am I gonna do? These guys are all the same. They're selected by these people. Well, you know, it's, that's proof that the people we elect right now, the, the governments that we have, the structure of our, of our political system is not democratic anymore. They don't represent us. We should have a system. We, we need massive electoral reform that permits us to call them back, to get rid of them and to fire them. That's a massive restructuring. How are you going to do that? There is not an easy answer to that, except to say you have to believe that education and freedom of thought is our solution. If I didn't believe that, I couldn't, I couldn't exist. I would go and bury my head in the sand. I would slit my throat. But I have grandchildren. And I'm on this earth. And I was created. And I was born with fundamental rights. They're mine. They're my children's. They're yours. And you, you kind of have to move into another realm. You kind of have to move into almost a kind of a spiritual realm. A lot of people maybe don't want to go there. But you're human, and your humanity includes that aspect of you, and that's the only thing that's going to save us. There isn't an easy answer except to believe in the common good and to believe historically. Look throughout history of all the times. There have been oppressions, terrible, terrible oppressions of humanity. And humanity has always survived. Hope has always survived. Why is it that throughout all of time, endlessly, people will come forward and die and tolerate persecution and punishment and torture because of something they believe in that's right? That's our answer. We have to believe that it's within us and that the humanity reached by your people in a community such as this who are working on keeping the brain working, education and its importance, that that's our solution, that that's our key. So my thanks again to these people who are organizers of this project Censored, which is one aspect of what you're talking about and that I, I believe, I have to believe their levels. There's belief is one thing as compared to, we all know that. Um, People are not going to tolerate being oppressed. They won't. They never have. They've always come through it. And we will again, even though we're facing maybe one of the worst times in the world's history. That elite has gone too far. They're crazy. I don't know. It's us. We have to do it. There's nobody going to do it for us.